feel like this gathering day is not so much about a book, but about a person. Uh, it's about Elizabeth Jennings, and um, I think it's about time that we all knew who she was, and we celebrate her accomplishments 164 years late, uh, but at least we now have a story about her that we has been researched and, and published, and I feel really good about that, and so I feel like we're all celebrating her today. This is the only known photograph of Elizabeth Jennings. Um, we are lucky that there was one photo and that we were able to find it. Uh, how this all started uh, for me was this creepy old house in Austin, New York, where my husband and I used to live. We used to go for walks, and this house was in our neighborhood. It was falling apart. It looks pretty good here, but by the time we were living there, it was falling apart. And I looked into, what's the story behind this house? This is what happens when you've been a newspaper for years. You're nosy about everything. So long story short, we heard rumors about it and so on. The house had belonged to Chester Arthur uh, when he was an attorney working in New York. Well, I knew he'd become president of the United States, but I didn't know that much about him, so I started looking into it. This became, it just grew, it became a hobby for over like 20 years. Um, I was researching him, and one of the things that came up was that he had been very interested in equal rights at the time that, uh, well, equal rights, not civil rights in that era. Um, he was way ahead of his time, and he doesn't get any credit for it. So we're trying to give him some credit now. Um, he was from a family that was very uh, emphatically anti-slavery from upstate New York and Vermont. And so he plays an important role in this story. So I'm reading about him and researching him. I'm at the New York Public Library and I come across this case, a very famous case at the time, a very early uh, rights case, that he won as a young man, and it was called Elizabeth Jennings versus Third Avenue Railroad Company. Well, I had never heard of it, and I was intrigued. And I knew quite a bit about black history because I had been working with the Delaney sisters, uh, whose father was born into slavery. And um, I thought, well, I've never heard of this. I, and I couldn't find anybody else who had heard about it either. So I started spending more time looking into it. It became a hobby, as I said, and whenever I had a chance between other book projects, I kept working on it. I spent a lot of time digging through microfilm and microfiche, which I think a lot of people here today probably don't know what that is, but it's an old-fashioned way to dig out material, and it takes forever. You have to fill out a little form, and if you figure out the date, and then you give it to some guy, and he disappears, and he comes back with this roll of, and you put it on this, this machine and eventually you find what you were looking for or hoping to look for but uh, it's a lot slower than the internet a lot of this stuff is not on the internet even now um, and I'm not sure if it ever will be um, so I'll just give you a little overview of what happened uh, the events of Sunday July 16th 1854 This is the intersection where Elizabeth Jennings was a school teacher. She was also an organist. Um, she was uh, going to church to practice with the choir. Uh, this is, she left her home, she was with her parents, and she left their home, it was the corner of, uh, near the corner of church and chamber, chambers, and she walked to the streetcar stop at Chatham and Pearl. So she needed to catch the Third Avenue Railroad line in order to get to the First Colored American Congregational Church where she was practicing with the choir. This is what it looked like then. Now this is, um, it was called Chatham and Pearl, but now it's Park Row and Pearl. Notice the horse-drawn streetcar in the lower right. And obviously today, the intersection could not look more different. If you were to go there, you would see uh, 
uh, the Metropolitan Correctional Center, the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York, the New York State Supreme Court, and the headquarters of the New York City Police Department. And I can tell you from experience that just wandering around with maps and notebooks, you get a lot of attention when you do that in that neighborhood, in that corner, because <laughs> they all want to know who are you and what are you doing? So, um, Oh well, I'm looking at I'm looking at New York in the 1850s, and I'm trying to figure out. And I'm like, okay, uh, but it's just an amazingly different place than it was at the time. Uh, I think that some of the kids will be very interested in this. New York was not what it's like today. Uh, to get to the streetcar stop, Elizabeth had to walk through the Five Points neighborhood, which is a really was the worst neighborhood in New York. And yes, there really were wild hogs living in living in the streets. And they would come up to you and like poke at you. And of course, there were lots of wild dogs and things too. But the hogs were, were a big problem. Um, five Points was famous. Even Charles Dickens, when he came to America, wrote about. He visited Five Points. He said this is bad or worse than any slum in London. So poor Elizabeth, in order to get to her streetcar stop, she had to walk kind of through five points to get there. Um, it, I mean, the city was really disgusting. And this, is, this is from the book, and I'm just gonna say, the city that Elizabeth Jennings lived in was much smaller and much dirtier than it is today. As she made her way to the streetcar stop, Elizabeth would have walked around piles of horse manure and maybe even the bloated remains of a dead animal or two, but frequently a horse that had been left to rot. It wasn't uncommon for two to three feet of garbage to be piled up in front of buildings. To make matters worse, women of the time wore long dresses that came down to the ankle. Elizabeth had to navigate these streets while trying to keep the hem of her dress clean. Um, so she gets to the intersection and She's waiting for the streetcar. She's starting to get worried that she's gonna be late to the choir practice. And she had every reason to be concerned because when black New Yorkers wanted to take a streetcar, they encountered rules that forced them to wait for one displaying a sign that said, colored people allowed in the car, or they could take a white Car, if none of the passengers complained or if the conductor let them ride. So this left them at the mercy of the white passengers on the white cars and especially the conductors. If they were having a bad day and they were mean, they wouldn't let them ride. And the problem was that these, um, the colored, so-called colored streetcars were often late if they came at all. So it was a constant concern about trying to get wherever you needed to go, to work, uh, to church, etc. cetera. Um, if you needed to take the streetcar, which was the best way, uh, you were uh, vulnerable to the whims of other people. 